Welcome into another edition of the BrownZone.com Zone Coverage Podcast. My name is Andy Bullbarch with AM 930 WEOL and 100.3 FM. As always, joined alongside Scott Petrek, Browns beat reporter for the Chronicle Telegram, Medina Gazette, and of course, BrownZone.com. Well, Scott, I'm sure this isn't the way we drew this up. I think a lot of people tuning in were hoping that we'd be discussing a victory or at the very least a much closer encounter than the one that you witnessed on Sunday as the Browns fell 43-13 to the Tennessee Titans. Scott, let's start with your three major takeaways from that opening day loss. Well, you're right. It was certainly a stunner. I thought the Browns were going to win and win relatively easy. Um, when I do the three takeaways, you got to start with the penalties, and we'll get into all these more, but just to touch on them quick, the penalties, 18 for 182, unacceptable. The offense, we expected so much. OBJ, Jarvis Landry, Nick Chubb, Baker Mayfield, and there just was never any rhythm. They had the one good drive early, one drive in the third quarter, and that was it. They didn't get the ball past the Titans 40 any other drives during the game. So I thought... I was surprised at the lack of consistency and rhythm in performance. And then the defensive line. You know, we talked all through training camp. You and I talked time and again about how this had a chance to they had a chance to dominate. The Titans are missing two starters from the O line and they did not take over the game. So those are my quick takeaways and then we'll get into those deeper. But just overall, what a letdown for everyone expecting so much more from that week one game. As you mentioned, we're going to come back around to a few of those points again and really give you an opportunity to elaborate on some of these. But I want to begin with the disappointment. And again, I think it's not necessarily the loss. I think it's the way in which they lost for sure. And I think you could certainly make the argument the way they started. That first drive, everybody was hyped, thinking, okay, this is fantastic. This is what we expected. And then that was pretty much it. There are a lot of things that certainly led to that. But, you know, give us a sense as to what it was like down there in the locker room after the game. I'm sure there was certainly some disappointment. But, boy, did you experience much of the way of shock down there? Yeah, that's interesting. I I would say, first of all, I felt bad for the fans. And there's definitely a shock value there. I mean, I was at a family thing Saturday night, and people were counting down the hours until the game. Right? They were so excited. Guy showing me a picture of the fan, the Converse custom made ones with Browns on the back. I mean, guys are out of their heads, ready for this game. And the fans were in the stadium on time. The Muni lot was packed. It started filling up the night before. I mean, it was just the anticipation was out of this world. And then they start, like you said, then they start with a great drive. You're like, all right, this is what everybody expected. And then it just stopped. And it fell off. And then disappointment set in and shock set in. All of it, I think, maybe more so for the fans. I think the players, when you're in it, you don't have the time to be shocked. You know, So the guys I talked to, you know, I talked to Demaris Randall and Sheldon Richardson and Devereaux Lawrence and Larry Ogunjobi and Baker, obviously, And they tried to turn the page already. They were talking about bouncing back, and one game won't define them. Now, I think in a private moment, they would be shocked, right? I don't. Demarius Randall told me they were going to blow teams out. He thought they could go sixteen and zero, and they get beat by thirty at home to a team that's a good team, but they're not a juggernaut. Nobody expects Tennessee to make any kind of Super Bowl run, but yet here the Browns are with all their stars, and they just get beat in pretty much every phase. So I, I think there is shock underneath. I do think that these players, especially the ones that the Browns have, are so confident in themselves that they won't allow that they won't allow it to kind of define them. You know, I just think that's their nature. Baker won't say, hey, I'm not a three interception guy. Randall say, hey, I'm not the guy that gave up that bomb. Even though that happened, they kind of don't let that into their psyche. So I you know, just to wrap up, I think the fans are definitely stunned. I think Freddie Kitchens might be stunned. There's no way that that's how he figured his first game would go. But the players have experienced this before and can't afford to be stunned. Okay, while we're on that same topic, I want to stick with the psychology of this just because I know this was a topic of ours last week talking about how the psychology of the lack of success in the history of this franchise going back you know, a couple of decades, how much would that factor into this? So I guess my next question to that would be, you know, if you're to take a look at this thing and think, okay, Here's a blowout loss that certainly nobody saw coming. Right. Any chance there's a silver lining and that could be a good thing in that you talk about how confident these right. guys are and they try and not let you know one loss define them or really get into their head. But is there a chance that maybe 
this opening day loss, as embarrassing as it yeah. was for a lot of these guys, could be a good thing because in some ways – it certainly humbles you, and it gives you the idea that you're not superhuman and that you can't be beaten. I, I do think there's that chance, and Demarius Randall said as much. He said maybe this is a good thing. I don't know if he used the words wake up call, but that kind of that kind of thing. He's, I think he said punched in the mouth. Although the Titans said they punched him in the mouth too, so <laughs> there was a lot of punching in the mouth going on. Um, but he recognized that hey, maybe this is what we needed to sharpen the focus and to realize maybe we're not as good as we think we are. So. I think that could be a good thing. I think this team has, just from its personality and psyche, has the potential to be overconfident. That's the kind of guys it feels like they have on this roster. So maybe a little humility can go a long way. Having said that, that's not how you want it to happen, right? I kept thinking, even though the Browns, after that first drive, it never felt to me like the Browns were the better team. Like Tennessee just felt like the game plan was better, the coaching was better. Maybe talent-wise the Browns were better, but it never felt like the Browns are dominating this game or even playing better in the game. But while it's going on, I kept thinking, well, it's a close enough game. The score's close enough. Maybe this is a perfect week one, is you don't play well, you get a ton of penalties, but you pull it off and win, and then Freddie's got a million things to coach off of, but at least you won a game. And obviously it didn't turn out that way. It went the other way, and it got rolling the wrong way in that fourth quarter. So... I, I get that there's things you can learn in a loss and plenty of things you can learn in this loss, but it's going to be fascinating to see how they respond in week two because all of a sudden there's a ton of pressure going to week two. We talked about it. In my opinion, the first two games were the easiest two games of the first seven. And if you start at 0-2, then you go home for Sunday nighter against the Rams at Baltimore, who lit up Miami yesterday, all of a sudden you can play some doomsday scenarios out. And those will stop for at least a little while if you go into New Jersey and beat the Jets on Monday night. How much of what we saw on Sunday do you think had to do with a lot of these guys, the starters anyways, not playing as much in the preseason? I pose that question to you just because I know that's been a hot-button topic for, I wouldn't just say a few weeks, more like a couple of months now, and that's not something that just popped up this past season or this past preseason. But after that Packer-Bear game, (laughs) <laughs> on Friday, a buddy of mine reached out and said, you know what, this is what happens when these guys don't play in the preseason. Do you think a lot of that came into play for the Browns on Sunday? See, I can't I can't argue that it didn't come into play, and especially that back, that Packers-Bears game. That was that was a tough one to watch. And I get, the, I get the connection. I'm just not ready to say there's a cause and effect. Tom Brady didn't play a lot in the preseason, and they scored 33 last night against a pretty good Pittsburgh team, right? And you look around the league – Baltimore played great. I don't know how much their guys played in the preseason, but I'm sure it wasn't full games. They come out and play great. So I thought Tennessee played great. And their guys, Derrick Henry, didn't play at all in the preseason. So I think that's an easy thing to point to. I would say where it shows up, it, to where it showed up in the Browns game, to me was the connection between Baker and his receivers. And Freddie can say that's not an issue. Baker can, they can all say it's not an issue. But it didn't look like the timing was where it needed to be. And maybe that's some of the routes that were being called. Maybe they were too far downfield and Baker's first route was covered, so then he had to go to his – or first read was covered. So then he went to the second one, and by then pocket breaks down and you're kind of off your back foot. And I saw a lot of those plays happen yesterday. But again, maybe it's because Odell wasn't quite where he thought he sh- – where Baker thought he would be, and then you hesitate to throw it. You know, So I think if it showed up, it was there – but I hate to use that as an, as an excuse, and I think good teams figure out a way to overcome that. You were pretty quick to point out the issues on the offensive line, especially in that first half, and I think some of those issues may be correctable, but at the same time, it's one of those things that I think fans look at that and say, boy, this was a major issue throughout the course of the preseason, and it doesn't look like anything yeah. was really fixed. Do you think a lot of those issues are correctable? I don't know, and that's scary, right? And I think that's scary for fans to hear. I assume Greg Robinson won't kick anybody in the head the rest of the year, so therefore you're not going to lose your left tackle in the second quarter, which would help. Uh, you know, I he didn't play enough for me to get a great gauge on how Robinson was playing, but in a little bit, I, I started to rewatch the game, and I didn't. He didn't jump out at me to making any mistakes, except he had that blindside block that cost him 15 yards, but they were over, able to overcome that. 
Um, so if you have Greg Robinson at left tackle, then all of a sudden we shift our attention to right tackle where Chris Hubbard struggled. And he gave up that sack for safety to Cameron Wake. And you know, then they moved. Then it became a mess when when Robinson got ejected and Lamb went out with the knee. Then I think it's hard to get a whole lot of judgments after that. But I will say this: when you have question marks on your O line, which they do at left tackle, right tackle, and right guard, you got to help them out. And I didn't think Freddie and the offensive staff did a good job helping them out. You look at the Titan. To me, what's so obvious about it is the Titans were on the other side of the field and they had the same issues. They were down two starters on their O line. Left tackle's out on suspension. Right guard has a knee injury. But they had the perfect game plan to help those guys. They ran misdirection. They bootlegged Mariota. They run screens, which you know frustrates a defense because you think you're going to get a sack and all of a sudden the ball's going over your head and it's going for 75 yards in the fourth quarter or late in the third quarter. So they had the right game plan to not put their quarterback in danger. Meanwhile, the Browns have questions on their offensive line and Baker's taking deep drops. He's taking a play action deep drop from the end zone down late in the second quarter when there's no need to do that. When you have a backup in at left tackle. And it felt like Freddie was like, This is my game plan. I'm going with it. This is what's gonna work. And I, I just didn't feel he did a good enough job protecting Baker and protecting that offensive line. And I really hope there's an adjustment coming into week two. And I think part of that's running the ball more because that helps the offensive line. It it puts the defense on its heels as opposed to going after your quarterback. I'd like to see – I know when you have as many weapons as they do, you want to open it up and you want to be splashing. We're, this is how we're going to beat guys. But I, would, I think they need to rein it in a little bit to help out that offensive line. So I don't know – I don't think there's a quick fix out there. I think the fix has to come with – come from within and yes these guys can get better individually as the season progresses but the coaches need to help them until that happens you had alluded to the lack of discipline that really stood out earlier too and I think this is the one thing that bothered most of the fans because you didn't see I don't think anybody really saw this coming 18 penalties 182 yards there was the ejection as well which you referenced I mean how concerned should we be about this moving forward because I think any coach can sit there at the podium and tell you we're going to fix that and you made a comment about that in one of your brownzone.com stories you know Freddie mentioned we don't practice penalties right right? that was one of his biggest takeaways and yet here's the first game of the season they're dinged 18 times for 182 yards yeah I mean first of all the Browns as a team hadn't had that many penalties in a game since 1951 so that just shows you what an aberration it is or uh, let's not call that because it might happen again in week two how unprecedented that is, right? So we're not making too much of it when we talk about these penalties over and over. Having said that, I don't think that's the reason they lost the game. I think overall they didn't play well. There's a million issues. But 18 penalties goes into why you lose. It goes into why you can't get offensive rhythm because you're first and 20 all day. But the bigger issue, and the one that is more troubling, is that you have the unsportsmanlike conducts. You have the late hits on the quarterback. You have the ejection. You have Miles Garrett. I don't know if it's retaliation or not, but he shoves his hand into the face mask of Delaney Walker and gets a 15-yarder. Those things can't happen. And that's all about discipline and composure. And I think it's fascinating. Freddie talked about not we don't practice penalties. And when Chad Thomas fought one of his teammates in practice, in training camp practice, the whole team ran sprints. Then they go to Indiana to practice against the Colts. And Freddie doesn't like how the first practice goes. He didn't like the tempo. So day two, the Browns fight everybody. Anytime a, chip, anytime a Colts guy shoved them, the Browns went after him. And then it escalated and escalated and escalated. And, and Odell Beckham says, yeah, we got the message from Freddie. And Freddie says, we're not going to back down from anybody. Well, that's a fine sentiment to have. And maybe the players should know better, right? Maybe Miles Garrett needs to know. My coach doesn't mean I get a 15-yard penalty in the game, right? And Sheldon Richardson knows the same, and Greg Robinson obviously should know he's not supposed to kick a guy in the head. But when your coach says we're not going to take any guff from anybody, well, then if you're Miles Garrett, maybe you think, hey, the guy just shoved me. I'm going to go back at him. And you can't. that can't happen. So I think there was a bit of a mixed message from Freddie, and I think it really hurt them yesterday, and he's got to figure out a way to rein that in in the next – well, they play next Monday night. So in the next week, 
He's got to rein that in because they're not going to win games if they have that kind of undisciplined behavior. And I just can't, like I can't get over some of those penalties, and they're dumb. You know, Jermaine Whitehead on the first defensive play of the game, shoulder into Mariota, Mariota on the sideline, fifteen yard penalty. Sheldon Richardson, late shove of Mariota, 15-yard penalty. Then the same drive, jumps off sides on third and four. Instead of kicking a field goal, possibly, they score a touchdown. Like, those are huge plays in the game, and they're all self-inflicted. So I guess, you know, if you're a Bronson, you could say, hey, if we eliminate the penalties, we have a much better chance to win, which is obvious, and maybe they would have won that game. But I don't I, – so I want to focus on the penalties because they're they're – so bad, I can't even. I can't even come up with a word. They're atrocious. But I also want to say, as a team, they didn't play well. Period. And I'm not even sure if you took away the penalties, did the Browns win that game yesterday? We've got you locked in again to the Brownzone.com Zone Coverage Podcast with Scott Petrak, Browns beat reporter with the Chronicle Telegram, Medina Gazette, and of course Brownzone.com. Boy, the Browns front four. That's a unit that we talked a lot about throughout the course yep. of the preseason and. You know, they did get to Mariota a few times, but certainly didn't get to him enough. What really stood out about that front four? I guess better yet, what really didn't stand out about that front four? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm going to start with Olivier Vernon, right? They trade Kevin Zeitler for him, so that weakens your offensive line. But you, but John Dorsey says, or thinks, another defensive end is more important than a right guard. And I would agree with him every day. But that defensive end better be good because Kevin Zeitler was a borderline Pro Bowl guy. And Vernon was a pro bowler last year, and I, I hate to judge too much off one game. But he played 50-some snaps, and he didn't have any stats. No tackles, no quarterback hits. It's hard to do, right, when you're playing that much and you're that close to the ball. Now people say, oh, he had a couple pressures, which he did. First play of the game, I mean, Mariota ran a boot leg to his side, so it's not like he beat anybody, so he chases him down. There's another play where he chased him out of the pocket when – the back actually chipped him inside, and he had kind of a free release at, the, at Mariota. But he didn't have an impact. Then when you look at Miles Garrett, had a couple of sacks, and that's great for his stats, and it's great for his you know candidate to be a defensive player of the year and an MVP. But he didn't dominate. And I haven't gone back enough to study, man, did they double-team him all game? And they probably did. But he didn't dominate like you'd expect a Miles Garrett to dominate. And he got that 15-yard penalty we talked about. So the one play that jumps out to me about Miles Garrett was a dumb play. Sheldon Richardson, same thing. He was active. Like, I saw him make some plays, but then he gets two terrible penalties. And I thought Larry Ogunjobi played pretty good. But we also didn't see the impact of the depth. We talked about the depth on the defensive line. I didn't see Chris Smith, Devereux Lawrence, Chad Thomas. None of those guys jumped out to me. Jannard Avery wasn't even active. So I just think when you go into that game and – Tennessee's missing two of their starters. That was an opportunity for this defensive line to send a message to the league that we're going to create terror all year, and they just didn't do it, and I think that's a huge missed opportunity. Yes, the Titans had a good game plan. Yes, they never really got in third and longs where the Browns could just pin their ears back. The Browns never got that lead where it sets up for the defense. But when you're supposed to be great, you don't need everything to go your way to be great. You're great, and that supersedes things. And, and I didn't think the Browns' defensive line came close to doing that yesterday. One more moment here on this week one loss, and then we'll start looking ahead to the week two matchup against the Jets on Monday Night Football. Any positives that you could take away from this game? I know you really have yeah. to dig for those in a 43-13 loss, but were there any positives to take away from week one? I'll give you the Scottish Hammer, Jamie Gillen. Um, he had one... I think it was his first punt. It was a little rough. He didn't catch all of it, and then he got a good bounce and a good roll, and it wasn't returned. And then after that, I thought he was great. They five punts, 46.6 yards, no return a net, no return yards at all, three inside the 20. So he did well because he was a question mark coming into the game. And Nick Chubb, right? Nick Chubb ran hard, 4.6 a carry. Not to be negative in the positive segment, but they didn't give Nick Chubb the ball enough. I thought that was – a mistake by Freddie and his staff that they never tried to establish the run. And I get it. I keep going back to this. We got Odell. You got Jarvis. You got – but it's okay to run the ball. It's okay to run the ball early and kind of set a tone and have balance. And it never felt like they had that balance. Second and 20 doesn't help that, but I never felt like the commitment was there to run the ball. But 
I mean, that's about it. There wasn't a whole lot to like in that game. No, there certainly wasn't, but that certainly sets us up sets us up with a ton of storylines looking at this week two matchup against the Jets. And boy, I'm not really even sure where to begin here because the Jets, they're coming off a heartbreaking loss as well. They let a pretty big lead disappear in the second half, especially in that fourth quarter. Well, what kinds of matchups specifically are you really excited about here in week two? Well, the Browns could catch a break. Their linebacker, CJ Mosley, left the game yesterday, had a big impact before he left. Um, feels like it seems like it's a relatively significant injury where he probably won't be back in a week, and that would help the Browns greatly. They know all about him from his time in Baltimore, a really good player in the middle of that defense. But when you look at this game, and I know they're not going to be on the field at the same time, but it's all about the quarterbacks, right? Baker, number one, Darnold, number three. I thought the Browns should have taken Darnold. Plenty of people did. Plenty of people thought he was going to be the number one pick. Obviously, Baker came off the bench and beat Darnold last year in that Thursday night game that broke the winless streak. It's too early to say who's a better quarterback. I know Browns fans would fight me and say it's obviously Baker. I think we need to see way more. Darnold still has a lot of physical ability, but when I see the highlights, struggles, tends to lock into his receivers. Um, Still big arms, still good athlete, probably a better athlete than Baker is, although Baker does a really nice job moving outside the pocket despite not having great, you know, speed, 40 speed. Uh, but you want to see those guys, right? It's a statement game for Sam Darnold. If he comes out and beats Baker, prime time Monday night. That says something about him and his future and how he can rise to the occasion. So we're watching those two guys, Le'Veon Bell, right? How the Browns handle him. And he's they've seen him a million times from when they played him when he was with the Steelers. But he's a matchup guy, right? He's a matchup problem. You get him out in space. So who's going to be it? Is it going to be, you know, TJ Carey trying to cover him out of a slide? Will it be Eric Murray? You have a linebacker trying to cover him. Um, and then coaching. How about, the, you know, Freddie Kitchens, you know, even all the negative, maybe Freddie Kitchens had the worst game of anybody, right? On that, which is, I, I'm not saying, you know, if you gave, well, you know, I mean, obviously he'd get a terrible grade if you graded him because his team lost by 30. I just mean debut, expectations. Everybody knows or expects Baker to be better. Everybody expects Odell to be better, to be better because they have track records. Freddie doesn't have a track record. So the only thing we know about Freddie as a head coach is he's 0-1 and lost by 30 at home to a team they were favored by a touchdown. So there's a lot of pressure on Freddie, right? We've talked about this. I think it's a boomer bust kind of year for Freddie. It could go terribly wrong, or they win 10 games, he's a coach of the year candidate. Like I just feel like there's that much talent on the roster, th- those expectations, all that falls on the coach. So he's got to go into New York, he's got to rally his team, and he's going against Adam Gase, who has a history as a coach, he was a head coach in Miami, but it didn't go great there, right? People in New York already have issues with him, there was a front office upheaval. So, you know, coaches and quarterbacks, and that's what this league is about, and I think we're going to get two really kind of good examinations on where these organizations stand on Monday night. Yeah, absolutely, and there are just so many different storylines, I mean, well, how about the guy that was the interim head coach here last year also and Greg Williams, right? <laughs> oh my He's gosh. the defensive coordinator going up against his former team. And yeah. you've got to believe there's a little extra motivation there because the guy who was his offensive coordinator while he was the interim right. head coach, they hired him over him. So yeah. uh, there are so many interesting storylines going into this game. No, you're exactly right. And I can't believe I let Greg sleep my mind for a couple of seconds there. Uh, that's a huge storyline. I I'm I got to find out when Greg talks this week because it's going to be it's going to be a story. Whatever he says is going to be a story. The guys talking about him will be a story. I mean, I know just leading into the season, Miles talked about how he limited him to a couple of pass rush moves and how he loves having freedom. Demarius Randall complained about playing so far off the line of scrimmage, it's free safety, and that he was forced to play corner with no notice against Tampa Bay's Mike Evans. So there's a lot of bad blood there from the Brown side. And then Greg, with his personality, is just going to want to stick it to him so bad. And practice against Baker for a long time, practice against Jarvis. He knows a lot of his personnel, knows the weaknesses along that offensive line. It'll be fascinating to see that chess match and then see if Freddie is able to take advantage of Greg's aggression. Because there'll be plays to be made there. You just have to go and make them and catch Greg in the wrong call at the right time. Good thing or a bad thing for the Browns that they have that extra day yeah. to stew over the loss and prepare for the Jets? Normally I would say bad because I think you want to get back on the field, get that taste out of your mouth. They don't want to talk to us for six days asking them about the loss. I think in this instance it's a good thing because they need some time to stew on it. I think it's good for them 
like we talked about, to be humbled, to be angry maybe at the way it went down. And not only that, there's a ton of stuff to fix, right? Got to fix the penalties. We got to fix the offensive line. You got to fix. There's a million things to go over. And I think there will be, there should be, and I expect there will be tweaks to that game plan. So with an extra day on the field to work on whether it's more two tight end sets, whether it's more Nick Chubb as opposed to three wides, whatever it is, I think they could use that extra day to try to fix many of the issues that were so blatant yesterday against the Titans. I don't. I, I get it. It's week two, but I'm not so sure that you can really overstate the importance of this game for Freddie Kitchens. It's been talked about throughout the off season. He's the guy under the most amount of pressure here because, well, I'm not sure if this is a correct analogy to use, but look, all the groceries have been purchased, right? <laughs> it it right, seems right. like you know John Dorsey's gone to the best grocery store you can think of, gotten him the finest ingredients. But now it's up to Freddie yeah. Kitchens to really put on that chef hat and start cooking. And this is a game where I think people are really expecting them to rebound. I'm not so sure that there's anybody else in that building under more pressure than him right now because, again, not just the way they lost, not the fact they lost week right. one, but the way in which they lost. And, oh, yeah, by the way, he's going up against a guy that the Browns picked him over. Sure. And as you mentioned, Greg Williams is really going to want to stick it to these guys. That, well, that's exactly right. And. You know, Greg, I'm sure thought he had a chance to win, to get that head coaching job, even though I'm not sure he was ever a serious candidate. I think the Browns, you know, Greg's a blowhard, and I think the Browns know that. And you're around a guy for two years, and maybe you love that. Like some people love it, and that's why he's gotten jobs throughout his career. I think it rubs some people the wrong way, and I don't think the Browns were ready to move forward with Greg as the face of that organization. That doesn't mean it won't motivate him, and it didn't upset him to a great degree. And you're right about Freddie, and that's the interesting thing. I don't think it's all perception because I do think the Browns are immensely talented and they have pro bowlers on both sides of the ball. But when there's that perception and that assumption out there, that puts all the pressure on Freddie. Because there's no – he Freddie's not – I'm just – you know, let's play a scenario out where Freddie really struggles and gets fired, gets fired, whatever it is. You know, week eight, after the year, four years from now, Freddie's not going to be able to look back and say – they didn't give me any talent. Like, some coaches can, right? Yeah. Mike Patton could look back and say, geez, that's, I mean, they gave me Johnny Manziel for crying out. Freddie's not going to have that excuse. He's got Baker Mayfield. He's got Odell Beckham. He's got Miles Garrett. So he doesn't have that excuse. And, and I think it's going to be interesting to see how Freddie handles this week. He was fine after the game yesterday. You know, his message was the world's not ending, which is fine, and that's probably the right message to have. But he's going to get tough questions today. He's going to get tough questions all week. How does he deal with that? Does he get defensive? Does he have? Does he set the right tone? Um, and it's going to be interesting. He asked for adversity. He said one of the first times we talked to about talked to him, "I can't wait till the adversity hits." Well, it got here early, and it got here in a big way, and it it packed a punch. So there you go. Now figure out how to handle this adversity. And if you don't, then people are going to doubt you because you said you could handle it, and. You talked about discipline, and they didn't play with discipline. There's just a lot of things. Freddie talks great, and I love talking to him, and I like Freddie. But it's got to translate, you know. And it's only one game. Like I keep, but it was such a bad one game that I, I think it's fair to question Freddie after one game. And more importantly, how does he respond? Because that's what's next: is how does he respond? How does he get his team to respond? And that's what's gonna that's what's gonna matter, and that's what's gonna decide this season. Should be interesting to see how they respond throughout this week of practice, plus the extra day, of course, leading into next Monday's game against the Jets. Well, I think for the second straight week here, we normally wrap up with your golf shot of the week, but you've been so busy, busy with the Brown stuff, and now that your back is finally cooperating again, you'll have an opportunity to get out there and do some more golfing. Did you have a golf shot of the week? Well, you know what? I'm so sick of not talking about golf that I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go back into my archives because I have not played. I I I'm afraid to look at my calendar if it's been three or four weeks. It's way too long. I'm gonna try to get out Wednesday. That's the plan. The Browns are off Wednesday. That's the goal. Um, but I did. I got. I'm just gonna tell this because I want to talk about golf. I played Band and Dunes last year. Met my uncle from Denver. Went to or the co Oregon coast, and it's unbelievable. It's pricey, but it's unbelievable. It's right there. It looks like kind of a pebble beach. You're right on the cliffs. Anyway, I hit a four iron out of a bunker, out of a fairway bunker, to about eight feet, and I couldn't believe I did it. And I we have caddies there, and the caddy looked at me and he saw the look on my face. He's like, "What?" I'm like, "I can't believe it." He goes. Why can't you believe that you hit that shot? And I'm like, I don't know, but I can't believe it. Just because fairy bunker, four iron, whatever. 
And there's a lot of traps out there. And I had a couple good fairway bunker shots, especially that day. I had a really good round that day. Um, but that one looked with me, and he's like, well, shouldn't you expect to hit it like that? I'm like, I guess so, but... You know, I'm not that up. I'm not that type of golfer where I expect to hit every shot really well, especially a four iron out of a fairway bunker. It's a hell of a caddy, man, trying to keep your confidence <laughs> at an all time high. Yeah, I tell you what, he was a great caddy. I could talk yeah. about Amos for hours. He was great. <laughs> trying to keep your confidence at an all time high and keep it up there, right? <laughs> he now, was. He hey, was great. He's not trying to let you down throughout the course of a round. <laughs> he was. He, he was a. He was a trip. He was really good. He's a really good golfer too. But uh, he was something else. Yeah, he he was. I could we well I mean, we should have an Amos segment every day because I could tell you stories about this guy. He was fascinating, and he I think he caddied for us like six times. So we spent a lot of time together. Very nice. Well, Scott, hopefully next week we're talking about something entirely different: Browns and Jets on Monday Night Football. As we discussed a few moments ago, that game certainly will not be short of storylines. That's for sure. Scott, a pleasure as always. We look forward to doing this again next week. Thanks, Andy. Hey, maybe we'll have uh, something better to talk about. Absolutely. That's going to put the wraps on this edition of the brownzone.com zone coverage podcast. For Scott Petrak, this is Andy Bullbarch saying thank you again for listening, and we will talk to all of you again next week.